Chaos in the Middle East is growing. It has spread well beyond Gaza and the Red Sea is now in flames. And I'm bringing updates for you and if you think the chaos is over, you might want to brace for impact. We are going to talk about Iran escalating the situation. China is also doing a 180 on all the sanctions and the massive earthquake that just hit Japan. We are going to have to talk about that as well. And we are only in January, not even past week 1. In our lead story today, Iran sends warship to Red Sea after US sinks Houthi boats. And this move is going to amp up an already volatile situation. Just imagine this guys, you have western warships from the coalition patrolling the area and now you're injecting the Iranian warship, what do you think is really going to happen there? And the timing of this is extremely important. This deployment comes after the US Navy sunk 3 Houthi boats inflicting almost a dozen casualties. And now that we have Iran's warship sailing through the El Mandeb Strait into the Red Sea, the big question is what are they doing there? Is it to protect the Houthis? Because if that's the case, we could see a firefight between the coalition and Iran if things really get out of hand. And if you were ever wondering how Iran could enter this war and turn it regional, this might just be it. All it takes is for just one miscalculation, right? And we'll be in a bigger conflict throughout the Middle East. Iran has also rejected the US and UK's call to end support for the Houthi attacks. In fact, they praise the actions of the Houthis calling it brave. And this makes you wonder if there might be any connection at all between them. The UK is already planning with the US to strike the Houthis directly in Yemen. According to their defense minister, Britain is willing to act to deter threats. This includes military strikes on the Houthi bases. So it makes sense why Iran has sent their warship to the Red Sea. It's a gambit to challenge the West. If you attack the Houthis in Yemen, you might just drag us into the conflict as well. Are you willing to risk it? And before you think the coalition won, it's important that we focus on one key statement made by the UK. It tells us why they might actually defend the Red Sea at all costs. From Grand Sharps, if we do not protect the Red Sea, it risks emboldening those looking to threaten elsewhere, including in the South China Sea and Crimea. This action no longer is just about securing the Red Sea or countering the Houthis, right? It's now about sending a deterrent message to Russia and China. Crimea and the South China Sea is kind of obvious who he's really referring to. Now while Iran is advancing their warship to the Red Sea, the US is pulling out an aircraft carrier from the region as well. The USS Gerald Ford, the massive aircraft carrier, is heading home after an extended deployment. Sure, they will get replaced by warships and destroyers, but this is a big psychological break, at least for Israel. Remember that the US is providing both diplomatic and military cover for Israel. Vetoing the UN ceasefire resolutions is just one part of the equation. Another equally important variable is securing the sea. Now there's a reason why any embargo on Israel won't work, right? If you cut off oil or exports to them, America will simply divert supplies to the country. With the US Navy guarding the sea, no attack will work. Weapons will also reach Israel without a problem. Biden just approved the sale of 14,000 tank rounds worth over $100 million to Israel. The ammunition is going to reach the country because the Red Sea is secured by the US Navy. But with the General Ford now leaving the region, it tells us of the reality on the ground that the US can't support Israel forever. It's likely a warning that sooner or later, Washington will exit this theater of war. They are spending a ton of money already and the Russia-Ukraine conflict is far from over. Funding two wars is crazy. And considering the US national debt is about to break $34 trillion, this situation can't last forever. In other words, Netanyahu has to wrap things up soon. So it's not surprising that Israel is pulling back their troops as the carrier strike group heads back to America at the same time. Now the fighting's not over guys, it's going to continue for many more months. Netanyahu has told the world of his objective that Israel should control the Gaza-Egypt border zone which means this war is far from over. But I want to emphasize that the damage has already been done. Whether the conflict ends tomorrow, next week or next year or 10 years later, Arab perceptions towards Israel have changed forever. Remember the Saudi-Israel normalization deal? Well, you can throw that into the trash can. It won't happen anytime soon because public opinion has shifted in a very big way. 96% of Saudis believe Arab countries should cut ties with Israel to protest the war. This is going to make Biden's end goal of a US-centric Middle East near impossible now. 
And pay attention to this part. A majority of Saudis supported a political solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict over a military approach. If we zoom out and look at this strategically, this is a defeat for America's grand plan. The Red Sea is destabilized. More money is being spent in this crisis and the end result is still a loss of influence and power in the region. So don't be surprised if the US eventually throws their hands in the air and they start pulling away support fast. As speaking of war, let's talk about the economic front between the US and China. And a big shout out to our sponsor, Private Internet Access. We know the importance of keeping our investments private, but are you doing the same for your data? Now, using the internet without PIA is like having your password televised to the whole world when you type. Anyone can sneak a peek and access your private accounts when you are asleep. Online browsing today is getting more and more dangerous. You don't want your identity stolen and definitely not your financial information. And this is why having a VPN is just so useful. PIA helps to hide your IP address and encrypts your internet connection through an encrypted server. And this helps your data, your activity, and what you invest in confidential. And what's awesome is how PIA protects all your devices. It's available for Windows, macOS, or Android, and there's no limit to the number of devices you can use it on. PIA covers over 84 countries, including every state in the US, so you can access more content than ever before. Just one click and you're good to go. Best of all, PIA is risk-free. There's a 30-day back money guarantee and 24-7 customer support, so you can get started with private internet access and get an exclusive 83% discount using the link in the description below. you also enjoy 4 months for free for just being a valued subscriber to the channel, so check them out and get protected today. And by now, we know America has thrown the book at Beijing, and the most recent was restricting China's access to chip making tools and AI processors. But just like the sanctions on Russia, they are now starting to fall apart. In fact, the sanctions are helping to make China more self-sufficient. From Bloomberg, Huawei sales nears $100 billion in year of China's surprise breakthroughs. Recall what happened in 2023. Huawei developed their 4nm chip that freaked the US out. And the story kind of gets worse for Biden. Huawei sales have gone up in defiance of American sanctions. Revenue has jumped to $98.7 billion. Huawei has been selling a ton of smartphones and 5G technology within China itself and the world. And that is the problem with trying to sanction big countries like China and Russia. Throwing tax sanctions on a country with a manufacturing base might slow it down, but it definitely won't curb progress at all. Now, the sanctions started long before Biden took office. Back in 2019, Trump cut Huawei off from their overseas suppliers. Then came the 2020 lockdowns and we saw revenue crash by 30%. But Huawei sales in 2023 last year were strong, with Q4 coming in at 243 billion yuan. That's a 27% increase from Q3, putting it well above the pre-sanctions level. This is a clear example of supply chains getting decoupled. In the not-too-distant future, guys, we'll see China develop more advanced chips with bigger technology breakthroughs. And that means countries in the global south, especially Russia, don't have to only rely on chips made by the G7. This cuts down reliance and sanction proves them as well. So if you're Saudi Arabia, you don't need to fear dealing with China anymore. You can get advanced chips from Huawei directly. And that's why this economic war between the US and China isn't going to end. America has vowed action on Huawei's breakthrough and they are moving to squeeze China even further. Because of the tax sanctions, China began buying tons of chip makers from ASML in 2023. Just look at the huge difference in purchases between 22 and 23. It's 5 to 10 times larger. Beijing's aggressively stockpiling lithography systems, and this gives them a big buffer to develop their own technology to play catch up. And it won't be long before they develop their own machines as well. In response, the Biden administration, they are freaking out. They have requested ASML and the Dutch government to cancel shipments to China ahead of schedule. The export bans have to come now and not a few weeks later. And just like any other sanctions, it might work in the initial stages, but it would ultimately fail again. Once China builds their own lithography systems, there will be a seismic shift in the global economy. They are half a generation away from US technology and that's around a 3-4 to four year gap which isn't long considering Beijing is pouring in tons of money to accelerate production. So it's just a matter of time before these sanctions fail once again. 
And when China develops their own, they could very well spark a price war in retaliation with the United States. But let's quickly touch on a big tragedy that just hit Japan. And if you didn't know yet, a major earthquake has struck Japan's western coast. And this has also triggered tsunami warnings for the Noto Peninsula. Japan lies within the Pacific Ring of Fire where four of the Earth's tectonic plates converge. So they can easily experience over a thousand earthquakes in a year. That's insane. A quake is nothing new, but this one is major and it comes at a horrible time where Japan's economy is in danger. This is a 7.6 earthquake on the Richter scale and that is enough to collapse buildings and cause big infrastructure damage in the cities. Just look at this big crack in the ground, the roads are definitely destroyed at this point. But let's talk about the economic impacts because Japan now has to spend even more money to repair the damage. And if you are local living in Northwest Japan, energy prices are now starting to soar. From Bloomberg, daily earthquakes in Japan send spot power rates up by 15%. Because of the quake, 1.2 gigawatts of coal-fired power has been shut down. About 33,000 people also lost power as well. Obviously, this isn't as disastrous as Fukushima which saw a nuclear meltdown. But there's still an economic price to pay when it comes to all these natural disasters. Back in 2011, Japan suffered a big Tohoku earthquake that destroyed over 100,000 buildings. That was a 9.0 quake that literally took down Japan. And that also triggered the Fukushima nuclear accident as well. And according to the Japanese government, the total damage was 25 trillion yen or 5.2% of Japan's total GDP. That is a huge amount of money needed to rebuild Japan. So it's no surprise that Japan entered a recession in Q1 that year. The economy crashed by 3.7%. The quake and the tsunami disrupted production and caused consumers to cut back on their spending. As it stands, Japan's economy today is already horribly weak. The yen is down 20% against the dollar and inflation is still a big problem. Consumers just aren't spending as much as before. And with this new earthquake hitting Japan, this is a good sign for the third biggest economy in the world. Because of this, Tokyo will likely launch another big stimulus package to save the economy. Kishida is already about to unleash an extra $88 billion into the economy and two-thirds of this will be funded through selling government bonds. And this compounds Japan's financial dilemma even further. They are trapped deeper in debt and can't afford to raise interest rates. So the chance of a pivot now is very unlikely. This, however, will put more pressure on the yen and destroy people's buying power even further. And yes, this will hit the global economy because exports to Japan will drop. If more quakes happen, this will be terrible for both Japan and the world at large as well. Now, the global situation is getting more fragile. The Middle East is escalating, economic wars aren't stopping, and natural disasters are starting to pile up. I know the stock market is up and rate cuts are coming. However, we must look beyond just the United States. The only reason why it is still standing is thanks to endless deficit spending. And whether that can continue into the year, into 2025, I don't know, right? But the cracks are starting to show and there are more black swan events coming that we must pay attention to. But let me know what you think. Will Iran get dragged into the conflict and can China fully defeat the US tax sanctions? Let me know in the comments below. Stay safe. Be sure to smash the like button and subscribe as we navigate through these crazy times.